ready to go. So, present Solomon Sonia. Thanks. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Solomon Sonia, and uh, thank you very much for coming to our talk here on uh, Wi-Fi exploitation: how passive interception um, can lead to active exploitation. So, hopefully, it should be good. Um, well, let's see. Uh, here's what to expect in this presentation. I'll walk around some. I'll wave my hands a little bit. Uh, and hopefully we'll cover most of these things, just because I have an idea of what I want to talk about, and usually we just get carried away. And whenever uh, our um, Chris, whenever Chris tells me to stop, I'll go and sit down, and you know we'll take questions at the end. Uh, but one thing I do show here is the live demonstration gremlin, because uh, I, I know our previous presenter spoke about live demos, and the thing that happens so many times is that you know you have live demos prepared. It works perfectly in your office. It works perfectly while you're sitting down getting ready for the presentation. But as soon as you do something live, things crash. So hopefully that does not happen today. But if it does, just bear with me. I'll try and fix it um, as we move along. OK, so who am I? Uh, I am an assistant professor at the US Air Force Academy. Uh, I currently teach computer science, software security, cybersecurity. And this year, I also created a new course on network and digital forensics. Um, so I really like computer security itself. I like dealing with cybersecurity and cyber threats. So Hopefully, you'll see that trend in a lot of the research um, that I choose to do. Now, security at present. I like to consider how far have we come and how much do we still have to go in terms of securing our computer systems for tomorrow. Now, one thing um, that is usually common with a lot of our security architectures and our security implementation is that we still believe detection is the key. And with detection, this makes all of us accustomed to patch after discovery. Meaning, as soon as we find a vulnerability, let's go ahead and patch it at this point. As soon as the vulnerability is known in the wild and it, it could have a significant impact, then we'll go ahead and release a patch against it. But unfortunately, with this paradigm, not everything is patched that needs to be patched. Not all vulnerabilities that should be secured are, because maybe some, it might only affect two or three people. So we just move on. Now, this is a bad methodology. And this methodology I also refer to as the bolted-on approach which is as soon as I see something that needs to be done, I'll go ahead and fix it at that point. Even your antivirus programs dealing with signatures, as soon as we know that there's a malware out there, I release the signature, I hope it gets out to the world, and now we should be secure. Now we have new paradigms in protecting our systems that go into baselining, which are statistically anomaly um, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, antivirus. Um, but the things or the process that these architectures fail with is, I guess, it lies here in your baselining, such that you have to have a good baseline. If I do have a, base, a good baseline, then now I can detect based on anomalies from that baseline. Digitally signed software. All right, I'm going to tell a story about this. So last year, I was challenged whenever I like to write malware. I especially like to write malware in Java, because I, I think it's fun, and Java deploys on so many systems uh, around an enterprise. So I was told that, did you know that this Java and all these applications that you write will no longer run anymore because they are not digitally signed. Thus, as long as we digitally signed a lot of our code, then all these other malware out there should be irrelevant. You know, they should no longer work. I then said, oh, okay, challenge accepted. So here I am, I went out and bought a certificate. So how do you buy a certificate? I first hired a lawyer, and then I established my own company. And then I went out and found who sells certificate signing certificates in order to sign your code. I then went to, there were three main antivirus vendors out there that sell you certificates that you can sign your program once it's signed, is verified secure, and now it can run on an enterprise. So I said, okay, fine. I had to register a company, I then had to purchase a phone number, and now I bought the certificate, but the companies have to verify or the people you buy these certificates from, they have to verify that you are actually a real working company. So what do they do? They give you a phone call. So I waited. I got the phone call from the company that I purchased from saying, hey, we see that you have a certificate that you wanted to purchase. The certificate was not cheap. This one is about six or $700 that I paid for um, on my own. We want to make sure that you're a true working company. I said, absolutely. In fact, we have over 500 employees this year, and we're expected to have record profits in the next following quarter. I said, oh, OK, no problem. Sounds legit. Then I got an email. Congratulations, your company has been verified. Here is your certificate signing, uh, or your code signing certificate. I said, very good. I took this now code signing certificate. I signed my malware. I was then able to 
execute my malware on the enterprise, trusted and verified. In fact, unfortunately, due to this digitally signed software, my malware now ran better after I signed it with a, a reputable company than even before it was signed. And the unfortunate part with um, just blindly trusting signed software is whenever you look at who actually signs this, it did not even say my registered company. No, it said the name of the actual organization that I purchased it from. So top AV vendor, one of your top three, it was one of them, it said verified, secure, and it ran perfectly on the enterprise. I said, okay, well, I think that one is good. Now let's move on to the next way we can attack and exploit computer machines. So in essence, what I'm just saying is your bolted on strategy has failed many, many, many times. So we do have to still come up with better ways to secure our systems using different technologies. And now let's go here to the fallacy with security. Our fallacy with security, as I see it right now, is that we believe so long as we start with a secured state, I just bought my computer, nothing has run, it has not touched the internet. Thus, if I want to secure my systems from here forward, let me just install the antivirus, let me install the software right now, and everything else shall be secure. Okay, no problem. We only have less than 30 minutes in this presentation, so I cannot go over all of these. But what I will focus on is this one. Because sometimes we try and say, well, good might be good enough, but not in this case. So here we are. The root of the problem that we see lies in how security is considered during its inception. So most people will create a product and then say, we'll patch it after it's been released, we'll install software on the computer system, and we'll still remain secure. But here is an issue. Three years ago, we started to notice, okay, so that was when the report started to come out in the news, that new purchased software, new purchased laptops in particular, this is Lenovo um, that was actually mentioned in this article. I wonder who makes Lenovo's. Hmm. So let's see. They said that now it was found, brand new systems that you are purchasing from the manufacturers already come with malware embedded on it. Now yesterday, Jake, spoke about the different rings that you have that programs can run on. So here I am at ring three, user level or application level, I'm now installing an application, an antivirus to protect my computer machine, where at even before ring zero, at your kernel level, at the hardware, there's malware embedded on it. So how are you going to protect it? There's no software I can create that I know of that can secure hardware that already has embedded logic to um, compromise that computer machine. Thus, 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 we still have a long way to go in order to better secure our computers. Now here, I like to talk about the anatomy of, a, of, of our cyber attack, because if I were to say, what are our steps to attack a computer machine? We all know this. We would say it by heart. We first start with reconnaissance. We scan the computer and enumerate its vulnerabilities, ports, services, whatever is running. Now we try and exploit this machine via some sort of penetration, and then whatever we want to do here in the middle. And then finally, you'll have some derivative of achieving your stealth and persistence and maintaining access. Okay, good. This is what we're familiar with, right? Any, any changes here? You can say something if, if, if I'm wrong. No, we're, we're used to this, right? Head nods, okay. Well, I like to propose that this is actually how our new cyber attack um, actually looks like now. In fact, Matt Weeks sitting right there, I once worked with him, and this actually the smartest guy that I've ever worked with before. We worked on a large enterprise to protect it and to secure it from malware. He was the best reverse engineer um, I, I, I've ever seen. So one of the things that we know in protecting our computer machines is that if I go back here to the anatomy of a cyber attack, this fails. So if you as the attacker, you want to attack or launch your exploits against a real enterprise that actually has software running, you will not get past scanning because you have various enterprise level firewalls that are already established. Thus, I cannot enumerate the machines behind the firewall. So if this works, your scanning fails. I mean, I can even ask Matt now. With all of the things that we had on our computer machines, we still saw that malware is still making its way onto the computer. So how is that working? This is because you will still see here your main five phases are along this side, but attacks have grown in sophistication. So instead of trying to brute force my way, how about I start to stage my exploits out there? Let me wait, let me be patient, let me launch different ways to attack the computer machine, and now I will be successful in exploiting large enterprise networks. So here's something I really like to pick on, because people's ways and their, tech and their capabilities on how they exploit people and exploit things always continue to change. 
Yesteryear, if we had a country that wanted to spy on a person, uh, you know, I'm not going to pick on one, but let's say the first letter starts with C and it rhymes with China. So a particular company or a country, if it wants to go after someone, you know, you might have a spy that might want to come close. Let me listen to what you're saying. Let me try and know you. So maybe you can release information to me. You know, I'm trying to understand、um, what do you do in your organization. But times have changed. Now, instead of even having to assign a spy, instead of trying to know you personally, I don't need to. Let me just release software. Software that, by the way, is definitely free, but will have some embedded software or embedded technology inside. Here's a case in point. Whenever I talk about cell phones, here are two main applications that I pick on because this was, you know, th this hurt that I liked it. It was really good, but I was like, seriously, we really need to look at how we protect our systems. Here are two simple flashlight applications. The only purpose of this software is to turn on the lights of your phone. Before we get we get there, how many people, just a show of hands, whenever I install an application on the phone, how many of you actually look at the permissions you are granting the application? Okay. That's good. Most people. Now, I would say most of you are probably lying, because we're in a hacker conference. Like, oh yeah, I'm sure, sure, I'm secure. Or, since most of you do look at the permissions you grant your applications, how many actually say, hmm, I'm not going to use this application because it wants access to maybe my voicemail or my phone calls or my messages? How many would actually refuse to install an application? Okay, still majority, majority of our people. But here's something that I mean, I'm still seeing in the wild, is that you have. Different applications out there, and now these applications, like this flashlight, why does this want information about your location? Some of these applications want information about your microphone, your contacts, your call history. Why would you do that? Just to have a simple function. I can tell you, as a malware writer, if I were to do this, of course, because if you're going into your meetings, you will have your phone next to you. Special proprietary or secret facilities that you might work at, your phone might be there. Oh, now I have an idea of what you're talking about. Other people might even write down notes on the phone with the microphone pointed to them. Perfect. That's an even better way that I would exploit my machines. Now, since we did agree that okay, fine, most of us do look at the permissions we、um, add and allow in our applications. So that means most of us are are highly embedded or are highly,、um, I guess, confident about the security software that you install. All right, no problem. But here's our thought question for the rest of this presentation. Even if we secure all of our devices that we use, secure your computer machines, your smartphones, how often do you care about securing the communication protocol that these devices use to communicate with the internet?、Hmm. Let's talk more about the communication protocols next. Now, how did we get to this particular research、um, area? I was sitting at an airport, walking, watching people just walk by as they get on and off of airplanes, and I'm wondering, a priori, without any information about where they're coming from. Can I determine where are their points of interest, their places of habitation? Because I'm just curious to know, like, wh where are you from? How would I know that without asking you? Well, I then thought, okay, if we can go through this, what is something that just about everybody has? Everybody just about has a cell phone. You will carry some sort of electronic device with you—a laptop, a PDA, or something. You'll connect that to the internet. All right. So now we have a connection. Now we have a protocol that we can actually start to analyze. Then. From understanding these, we go right here to your hacker's mantra. I wonder what happens if, and the rest is history. So in this case, research. I like to do research. I like to start with a few research questions that help guide what exactly is it that I'm looking for and what do I wish to accomplish、um, in my work. So we have the following research questions. I'm going to blow by these because I'm still checking time and I don't want to run out of time. But in essence, I wanted to see. Your phones, your smart devices—they have this thing called a PNL, or we refer to it as a PNL, which is your preferred network list. What your preferred network list does is your phone, every time you have it on and your Wi-Fi is simply enabled, is constantly beaconing. It's probing out there. Hey, access point, are you within the area? Are you in the area? Are you in the area? And then, if that access point does respond, which is the true access point that it should be, then your phone automatically connects to that access point, and now you have service. But I did not understand this further, and to see like how exactly does this、uh, look like in the frame、um, level, and also what happens as soon as that phone is established with the network? Does it continue to beacon? Does it stop beaconing? What does it look like um, um, further on? So that's what we do in this research. 
Now, here's some initial knowledge that is required because I talk about it um, in the project, and you'll see these words referenced in the code, that as soon as I'm going to release the code, I'm planning on having it released onto GitHub next week as soon as I get back home. Now, the 802.11 protocol, before I started this, I was actually intimidated by the Wi-Fi protocol because I was thinking it's complex, it's hard, it's difficult. But in actuality, it's not. I would say it's an intricate protocol, but it's not hard, it's not complex once you know exactly what happens, once you understand the frames and the communications. So I'll talk about these three here, and then we'll move on. So with the 802.11, your Wi-Fi protocol, you have three main types of frames. You have a management frame, control frame, and your data frame. Your management frames are useful, or they are used for setting up that connection, synchronizing communications across that socket, maintaining that socket, and then destroying it when two devices or two nodes are finished communicating with each other. We have control frames that are not mandatory in this protocol. This is mandatory, these are not. Your control frames kind of help see that, okay, if there's a lot of congestion in the network, perhaps some should back off until the line is clear. Then you continue to communicate. And finally, your data frames. Your data frames are your payload. Whatever it is I'm trying to communicate across the network, that's going to come in the form of data frames and then your 802.11 client authentication process. So let's talk about that right now. So two things I refer to whenever your phone um, wants to connect to the network. I first call it a Marco Polo type of instance in which you have two people or many people, one is saying Marco, the other one responding, hey, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. That's exactly what your phone is constantly doing whenever your Wi-Fi is enabled. But what I also refer to this as is an unstable marriage. Because what happens that I did not know until I actually looked at the protocol is even when your device is connected to an access point, it says access point like here, we're at HackLoo, so HackLoo Legacy, HackLoo IPv6, or HackLoo um, Dual Stack or something. Whenever your device says, okay, HackLoo, are you within the area? The access point responds, yes, I'm here. Let's go ahead and connect. So at this point, we then follow your connection, your authentication, and then your association process. And then immediately when that is complete, you start to see the data flow by your HTTP requests, your file uploads, file downloads, et cetera, whatever you're trying to do across that socket. But what still goes on is even when a marriage has occurred, your device is associated with the access point, that device is still saying, okay, yeah, I know we're married, I know we're paired together, but perhaps there's another device that we can connect to. So it's still constantly probing for other systems even when that connection is already established. I thought that that was pretty cool. But because that occurs, we are now able to do additional tracking and exploitation because your phone is constantly trying to connect to other devices even after a successful connection is established. Now here, here these are your pertinent frame subtypes. So it's just notes, it's just references for you. Because later on, whenever you're reviewing the slides, you actually want to see, well, how do you know that truly that frame you're looking at is a probe? or it's a beacon request. Because inside the frames, whenever each node, two nodes are talking, your access point and your smart device, they don't actually say, hey, I'm sending an association message, or I'm sending a beacon or an authentication message. No, you actually have to look at the particular bit that is set to know, okay, this is the type of message that's going across. And then this is vital because here are four most, well, three uh, most favorite frames. Here are the probe request and the probe response. These are your phones trying to say, okay, device, are you here? Can we connect? Actually, I'm sorry, that's your, those are your, your yeah, that's, that's your probes. And then your beacon is from your access point. Your access point is always saying, hey, I'm in the area, I'm in the area, I'm in the area. So if you know what to look for, then now you can tell as soon as a person has entered the area what they are looking for and different associations that have occurred at any point in time. Okay, so let's talk about building the sensor. So building the sensor is actually very, very cheap. In fact, did you know that you actually have most of the tools required in order to build your own distributed sensor to carry out a lot of exploitation? At a minimum, you can do the scanning and tracking of people very, very easily. So what things do we need? The first we need is an alpha card. So alpha cards, we are very familiar with these. Alpha cards are nice. I love alpha cards. Other wireless cards will work as long as you can put it into promiscuous mode so I can intercept or I can receive and analyze all other frames that are occurring on the network. But I just like alpha cards because they're cheap, go onto Amazon, purchase it for $30 or so, and now I have a new card that I can work with and write codes to. Then let's talk about T-Shark. How many of us have used T-Shark before? Good, good, about 10, 15 people, okay. What about Wireshark? How many have used Wireshark? Everybody, perfect. Well, if you've used Wireshark, you've actually used T-Shark. 
Because T Shark is the actual network packet analyzer that's receiving the packets and determining what's going on. And then Wireshark is your GUI on top of T Shark. So, thus, you are already familiar with some of the tools that we need. T Shark is free, it's already included in your Kali Linux instance. This is the only thing that we have to purchase for $30. Now, as soon as I purchased this alpha card, I looked at the, the actual antenna that comes with this. This is a five decibel antenna, usually by default, five decibel. That, that's, that's pretty good range. That means wherever this access point is in this building, this alpha card likely can intercept and communicate with that access point. So when I establish this actual software on my system that we'll get to in a few slides from now for the demo, I saw that, yeah, I'm getting good range. In fact, there was a particular time that I'm looking at different packages that come out, and I see a slew of just random requests that I had never noticed before. And I'm wondering, oh, who just came into the area? So I start walking around the house. I look outside, and I see, oh, a mailman has just delivered quite a few boxes of new alpha cards that I have purchased. Like, ah, oh, this must be him. This is good. Good range that we have with the alpha cards. But I wasn't satisfied with this actual antenna. So I then went on. Online antenna. This is an alpha card, five decibel range antenna. I said, hmm, what is the best range, longest antenna that I can purchase? This is five decibel range. And then I was very, very fortunate to find this guy. Five decibel, this is the 12 decibel range antenna. Now, this decibel range, it doesn't go like, oh, well, this is only two and a half times or so better than that. No, 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 no. This is much, much, much better, much better than this actual range antenna. In fact, with this antenna here, I can tell when my neighbors come into the neighborhood and they leave multiple streets away because of this. I can also send a signal much, much further because I have a better antenna to squawk that signal without even having to worry about the power input that's on my device because I still want to have boys soon. So power is careful. Now this guy, I call it the BAA. Okay, so whenever you see acronyms, I, this is my BAA. And, and for me, it stands for the big ah, antenna, because it's large and it works very well. So you can add this antenna to your alpha card to increase your range and also the area of reception that you can receive in working with this uh, entire system. And then finally, we have a GPS receiver. So one of the things or the limitation just about this work itself is that whenever we have SIDs that we can intercept, we then need to check it against a database, a large database of really good SIDs that have been intercepted at one point, and then correlate the GPS locations from that point back into the sensor. So once I have that information, then you can tell that a person must have been in that area once that connection had been established, so you can start to track people that way. But the limitation is what happens when a SID is not in that particular area? Or what if you want to be more specific in a local area that you've moved to? Well, you can actually add you just your own GPS receiver, plug it into the system. I've already created the interface for you that will work off of your GPS established, so now you can do your own word driving, and now you can have precise pinpoints of new access points and people that you're seeing in the area. Okay, now, as I said before, you already have the tools needed to establish this entire sensor, this entire network. How much time do I have? Am I okay? Okay, all right, all right, good. So, in fact, let's just do this. So if you don't trust me, let us go into Kali Linux here. Good. So I was running the system earlier, so at least you can see. Let me close this and stop. At least you, yeah, I was looking at, I'm sorry, I was looking at your SIDs previously. Got to admit, I'm addicted to it. Okay, so here we are. Once this loads, give me a new terminal, new window. So if we want to look at an initial instance of what, what, what things can I do just in, my, just in your own side, if you have just a simple alpha card, let's see. So let's start um, T-Shark. But the first thing we want to do, I, OK, I just want to make sure that we have the, our wireless card is actually um, recognized by our um, virtual machine. So the first, let's go ahead and put this into promiscuous mode. So first, I'll turn it off. Then I'll enable monitoring mode for promiscuous mode. Then we'll bring it back up. Come on. Aha. Good. Still looking good so far. OK, now let's start just T-Shark, because you can do this on your own. T-Shark. Now I will give it the parameters for the actual wireless card that I have plugged attached to the machine. Then let's use filtering 
on particular Wi-Fi packets or frames. That's this. Then I'll say, which field, bless you, um, which fields are we actually looking for? So one field we want will be the transmission address. So this is the actual address of the transmitter, the MAC address of, this, of the card that's communicating. This will be somebody else's MAC address or um, the actual computer, the MAC address of that wireless interface card. So that's what I'm saying, transmission address and also the source address, your source MAC address. Let's see. Now, the destination address, which MAC address are we actually looking for since it's, um, we're at layer two, we're, we're going from point to point, node to node communication. Okay. Then we'll say we want information about each frame that we're receiving. Finally, this. We're going to include management frames. Uh, I must have spelled something wrong. Okay, sorry, I must have typed something incorrectly. Where is it? Do you see it? T-Shark, what is it? At the end? Which one? Four, okay, here, wait. One second, Sid, WN, that looks good. This one. No, no, no that one's good. Yeah, that, that one should be fine. Why, WLAN, that looks good. What? Oh, I spelled field, yes, thank you, thank you, sorry. Is that it? Aha, uh -huh. gosh, just a simple typo, my, my mistake. Okay, so this is what we have at this point. This is, this is actually the main basis about writing the entire sensor. So here we have different packets that we are seeing across this network, and the most important thing that I care about should be something that you all can recognize already, which is this side. Huh. There we are, right here. Do you recognize these? Yes? These are the SIDs that we have going across. Many of us are connected here. Look, that's HackLoo, IPv6, HackLoo, DualStack. These are what various devices are actually trying to um, communicate with. Even though you're established, it's also saying this. So how do we now create the framework? Well, it's very simple. Write your own wrapper that interfaces with this information. Now I can send it to my own aggregator and make additional understandings about what's happening. For instance, if we know each one of these will send out an n number of different SIDs, let's go ahead and correlate these. Now, if we can correlate these, let's check it against the database. If we can check it against the database, now let us map what we've seen here to these persons to be begin to create a location history of where they've likely been. Okay? So let's create our sensor. What things do we actually need? But that's the basis of it. Just this right there, that easily. And you already have the tools. All you need is an alpha card. Let me go ahead and stop this. Okay, so I think the previous slide, next slide, no. All right, it's probably a hidden slide, um, but I actually included, oh, well, you can see it right there. You can see the fields that I typed in order to get that. So if you want to recreate it on your own, it's all right there. Okay, so now let's, let's, let's put it all together. Let's put this puzzle together. So here, I created this, a, a new system, a new tool called the Thea Sensor Suite. Now, at a minimum, I like to program things as distributed systems, distributed computing, such that I can have each module or each component to handle one thing, but to do that one thing very, very well. This is so I can now make it extremely efficient and extremely fast to carry out each step. Create your sensors, look at the network, create your different GPS receivers, understand where people are, tie this information together, all and aggregate it here with our main sensor aggregator that I just called it, the collector. Now, your sensors, these are optional. Here we have a GPS collector. If you have that, attach it to your actual sensor. I, I will show you the flags and how to get this running. So you can also include your own word driving or you can add additional fidelity to your current framework that you are running. Then we have the collector here. Now, geo-retrieval. Geo-retrieval is an important agent in the system because this one holds all of the SIDs that we've received along with the GPS locations. So any SID that has been detected ever in the past Whenever it's received from the sensor, the collector queries for this information from the geo retrieval, and then that information is brought back to the collector, so we can now see it later on. Then Wiggle. I really love the Wiggle um, database. The, uh, how many of us have used Wiggle before? Wiggle.net? All right, a few. If you have not, wonderful. In fact, everyone just say with me, Wiggle. Just wiggle. All right, so at least you heard it once or twice. Okay. 
So with this database, you can register, and now additional SIDs that you've not seen before, you can query if it's in this extremely large database. If so, you can add it to your own personal instance to add additional fidelity towards what people are using in your current area. So this is definitely a big module tie-in into the entire project. And now over here, we log. I log everything such that, OK, OK. OK, so we log everything such that if there are any problems or if one of your collectors go down, I can simply replay it at another side. Or if you have distributed collectors around, you can collect everything at one side, send it to another collector via the log, and then you can see the entire network replay again. And finally, all of this information, hackers, we love to live in the black and white text, or green and black, right? That's our, that's our colors. But some people would like to simply visualize what all am I truly seeing in the network, because we showed a lot of text scrolling. And in fact, two things I love most about being a developer, I love blinking lights and scrolling text because it means progress. But in this case, what if you only want to determine, well, what's happening inside my network? Well, I created separate interfaces that you can connect across the network, so now you can see what is truly happening, what decisions are being made by the collector and every other module inside the network. All right, so enough talk, enough talk, enough talk. Let's demo. Let's do some more demos. Let's hope all of these work. OK, so I'm going to start everything up right now except the Geo instance. So the Geo retrieval, that's the one that I, I already have up. And that's because this guy takes about, depending on your system, the hardware that you're using, it takes about a minute um, to get it started because I have various tables that you can actually incorporate into the system. So every table that you bring in, I then created separate, I guess, separate interfaces inside this to then also determine which cities are located to each um, SID that's been detected. So now you can put alerts into your system. Let's say if you want to find or alert whenever somebody from a particular city comes into your area that your network is able to sense. Well, this can provide alerts. So I created that. It just takes a while to actually do all of those um, tuppling. So that's why I have it started first. OK, so the first thing we, we do want to start will actually be the sensor. I always start with the sensor. If the sensor doesn't work, hell, nothing will. OK, so to start it, I will release also executables, but I'm still developing, so it's started with java-jar. Yes, it's programmed in, in Java. I, I like the language. I like it a lot. So if you choose to use Thea, you will get to use it in Java. So here we are, starting the sensor. It's just really easy. Java-jar, Thea sensor, enter. Now, what the sensor does, I created that as soon as it starts, it searches for the first wireless card that it can put into promiscuous mode, then it tries to put into a promiscuous mode, and then it says it, it was successful. Right? That should say, good, no problems. So at this side, you then have four questions to answer. The first one is, since it is a distributed network, what if you have a sensor here in this building, you have another sensor across the street, you have another sensor perhaps downtown somewhere. So we just add a little identification information so you know which sensor is providing information, because all of this goes back into your, sensor, your central collectors. So here, I'll say, um, specify your name, let's say, Hacklu. It's the name of this guy. Physical address, Luxembourg. OK, describe the location. Uh, this is Park Hotel. Park Hotel. And latitude launch, so you can leave it off. Because I did not connect the GPS receiver, but if the GPS receiver is on and working, it actually provides that information over into the sensor. So now. This is information that we are actually quite familiar with, except I add in quite a few more flags. But at least we can see that the sensor is working fine and providing additional data for us. In fact, can you determine, like right there, that's the blonde, that's the redhead, and the brunette. You see it? Yeah. I made a punny. OK, so we have the sensor working. The next thing we want to do is establish the collector. So the collector is receiving all of the inf information from the various agents that are working, aggregates it, and then starts to make decisions towards what's happening inside the entire network. So to do that is just java.jar, Thea, collector. Now, as soon as the collector begins, he has so many different threads that I added in. 
because eventually the system is going to grow. You're going to have a lot of people providing a lot of information to your collectors. So I just have multiple threads that are established. Each one handles frames as fast as possible to keep your system running um, as efficient, efficiently as we can make it. Okay, so the collectors established. How am I on time? Okay, good, good, good. There's still time. Okay, so what I want to do here is I'm just, oh, well, let me back up. So even though we have, let me do this. Okay, so the collectors established. If you type H or help, you can see all of the additional commands that you can send fr um, from the command prompt. Um, so these are additional options that you have inside each particular interface. It has its own tool set that you can use. So what we want to do is sensor connect. We want to connect the collector over to the sensor. So that's this command. Sensor connect, and then the parameters, just an IP address and a port. So here we are, sensor connect. I'm just going to say localhost. And the port that the sensor is usually listening on, you can change that. I, I give you the option, just read the help. Um, is by default, I have it on port 8080. So good. So at this point, the collector is receiving a lot of packets, or uh, I guess a lot of logs, a lot of lines from the sensor, and then it's starting to aggregate those together, and then it's starting to say, OK, what has it learned at this point? Now, oops. At this point, we're actually ready to visualize what are we seeing inside the network. OK, let me come out of Linux here. And let's establish the interface. So the interface is the visualization part of the actual sensors. Okay. So here, we enter the IP address of the collector, wherever the collector is. And I know the collector is, I should be here, listening there on port 80, and then let's talk about some of these widgets that will start to show up. So in a second, the interface is now receiving information from the collector, collector is receiving interface from the sensors, making various decisions. So you're now able to see new things that the collector has learned. He kind of spits it out here and here. Now, at this side, um, this is your RSSI, which is your received signal strength indicator. That gives you an idea of how close, with all things remaining equal, how close is each actual communicating device to the sensor. On this side, we will actually soon provide information on the unique devices, which device is out there and communicating. Is it an Apple product? Is it a Samsung product, Lenovo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the same thing up here. So that's unique devices. Which devices are we seeing? How can we visualize those things? Now let's go into the Detected Clients tab. So what we're seeing here, the, see that, OK. So for the Detected Clients tab, we have so many options at the top that we can see. Here are the various MAC addresses that we have. Here's the vendor. Wait a minute. Didn't I say we can do some enumeration or some um, information on the vendors? No vendors are showing. OK, let's fix that. Let's fix that. So if we want to have vendor information about the actual creator of each device that's communicating, or each NIC of the device, I created a separate agent. That guy is called OUI. So OUI stands for Organizationally Unique Identifier. Now, if I explain what that means, your MAC address, six bytes, your actual first three bytes of every MAC address is specific bytes that relates to the vendor, the actual creator of that system. So if you have a list of all of those MAC addresses, then you can correlate the creator of that NIC network interface card to who's communicating. So I did that for you. So all you have to do is establish a new agent. So here we are, java-jar. We want to load OUI, so the simple name is OUI. And once it loads, it's loading its own import table. It finishes, it establishes itself on a particular port, and then says, OK, I'm ready. So here we are. We're going to connect to the organizationally unique identifier agent on port 8081. So that's the collector. And to do that should be the text is going to continue scrolling, but let's just type OUI connect. I should do something about that. AD81. <laughs> OK, so now that's done. So now what the collector sees is, oh, I have a new module that I know how to communicate with. Now he starts to send every MAC address that he's seen before over to the OUI. OUI, if he sees it, recognizes it in his table, it says, hey, by the way, here's who's communicating. The collector receives that information and now tuples the creator of that MAC to the actual uh, MAC address or to the actual device. So let's now go back. Let's see, let's do this quickly. Okay, so it's starting to populate. There we go. 
So now you can see, back into the interface, the different vendors that are out there based on the MAC address specified here. So usually what I do see in a normal network is this list is filled with Apple devices. I, I guess people really love Apples, but it's not the case here. Or you turn off your phones before the beginning of the presentation. That also happens uh, most of the time. But here we can recognize, OK, different Apple products or whichever vendor. You can sort by these. You can search. You can do et cetera, whatever you want. And then we can start to see, OK, which SIDs have these devices requested in the past? Or what is it requesting currently? OK, so to do that, what I want to do, let's, um, I sort it here. It says, like, requested count. So you just have a, a count quickly of which devices are requesting things the most. OK, so I sort by that. I'm just looking at the top one, seven, this Sony, uh, Sony device, I don't know. OK, so if I double click it on the right side now, I can see the different SIDs that each device has communicated with and each device is, is, is speaking with. Oh, goodness gracious, you just said I have five minutes left. Is that correct? Five? All right. Um, can I have 10? OK, all right. Seven. Let's, let's gamble here. OK, OK, so real quick. All right, so here's um, one of the things that I like to do with the actual sensor. Hopefully, we can have participants. On your phone, like, actually, let, let's do this. On our phone, let me say I want to sort by SIDS. Let's go to requested SIDS. OK, requested SIDS, requested SIDS. No locations. Did I connect the geo? Did I connect Geo? Let me see. Geo is running. Socket closed. OK, that looks OK. It should be fine. Sorry, right, let me go back. Let me go back real quick. Come on. Wow, great. All right, let's try this again. Geo is on 8082. Geo connect. Did we get it? OK, that looks better. Okay, so eventually this list should, should populate with some of the geolocations that we saw. Hopefully it's going to work. Please find everything. All right, but anyway, before, oh, okay, so we have a few. All right, so now this is how we actually do this. How would we begin to track people? So what I will do, let me go over here. I have to hurry. Okay, let me say add to filter, populate. All right, so if anyone would like to participate on your phone or on your phone, let, let's see. Add a network. It doesn't have to be a real working network. Just add a network, and let's call it, uh, what, what's the name we should use? You, sir. So come up with something. Yeah. Anything. What's a random word? Fish. OK. Just add a network and call it fish. That's all. Just fish. F-I-S-H. OK? Because this is what I would do. Um, let me say F-I-S, fish. OK, good. So nothing is there so far. So go ahead, add it here. I will do it on my phone, too. So here's a, a use case and how to start to track. I would go to a hotel or something, and then I would say, hey, by the way, our Wi-Fi is called fish. It doesn't have to be the right one. So go ahead and enter it into your phone just to make sure that the connection is working. Of course, it's going to fail. When it fails, you say, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Let me contact the manager. We'll just call you later on once we figure out what happened. But at that point, as soon as they entered it in, you can start to track their exact phone. Now, as soon as you know, thank you very much for participating. As soon as you know the actual devices that people are having, OK, so there's, these are people inside this room. Let's start to double click. So I'm just going to sort by uh, requested count, fish, fish, fish. OK, come back. Hold on. What happened? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, requested SID count. Yeah, right there, requested SIDs, just saying what I want to sort on. So here, if we go to the right now, for each device that we specifically know, we can determine previous SIDs that your actual device is communicating with and is doing this all the time. Now, something else you have is tracking. On the right side, active, yes. So here you have a status that I provided whenever that device is still in the area. It tells you, hey, it's active. As soon as they leave, it finally tells you that person has departed. Now, if there are SIDs that we did have, which I'm not sure why um, my geolocation is not working properly. Oh, well, hey, here's one. OK, so let's go to this, this person. Uh, what device? Do we have a device? OK, so it's a Samsung, two Samsung phones. This one has HackLoo Legacy. Here, if we click on Map Selected Device, I wrote a separate interface that will take you onto Google. And then if we did know your, G, your GPS location, Texas, let me see what this is. HackLoo. The hell? <laughs> well. Uh, 
We'll take that as a live demo fail. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, but normally, I don't even know how that happened. Wow. What was that? It's a VPN? Is it a VPN, seriously? I don't think so. Well, I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, it, it would be nice. It would actually make me sleep better if it were a VPN. Does anyone know? Is it a VPN? Because <laughs> I don't know how we got Texas. All right. Um, so other, other things you can do. Uh, let's see if we can go back real quick. I think that's the only good look. Oh, look at this person. Wow, no need for that. But it's okay. They really like fish. All right, so let's go back to, let's, let's go to geolocation here. Let me eliminate that. All right, so if I did want, um, one thing you can come back here, say map all devices. So all of the SIDs that have been detected in this particular area, we can then click on them and then see the different device that has connected to it and where we've seen it in the past. So we are, do we have anything here in our post guest? Anyone here connected to post guest in the past? Sound familiar? No? Okay. What else do we have? Well, LNG. Okay. Oh, no. I'm getting the flag. Okay. So I'm out of time. Now, something. One minute. One minute. One minute, please. Please. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So let's do this. Let's do this. One thing we want to talk about is still vulnerability exposure in the entire network. So that's just tracking people, but we can actually extend the attack much, much further because your phones are set up on a blind system of trust, meaning it's always beaconing out there. Access point, are you there? Are you there? Let me go ahead and connect to you. But what happens, we're here in Luxembourg, your home could be in Sweden. We, we have a few friends we're talking to from Sweden or so, but what happens when that actual access point becomes right next to your phone? Shouldn't your phone determine that, wait a minute, I've strayed beyond the area, you're not the true one. No, it doesn't happen like that. Instead, any access point that says, I am actually the access point you're looking for, your phone will actually try and connect to. Okay, so everyone on your phone, what I'm going to do now, I have a separate Wi-Fi pineapple. Anyone worked with the Wi-Fi pineapple before? Yes, okay, good, a few. So this thing is, okay, say with me, Wi-Fi pineapple. Wi-Fi pineapple, it's okay. So at least you know it. Buy one, because it's awesome. So what can we do with this Wi-Fi pineapple? Okay, well, there are so many things, but what I'm going to connect to, hopefully this is going to work. Hold on. Turn off. I'm just going to do one. Disable. Okay, so by default, Wi-Fi Pineapple is set up on this address. I mean, there's, there are a lot of tutorials on how to use it. So let me log in. Okay, now once you log in, now this is actually the Mark V. So as soon as I get home, I actually have a Nano and a Tetra that are on the way. Um, because they've updated the device and the different capabilities that can be provided to it. Now here, I am actually just going to turn on the pineapple. Actually, before I do that, let me make sure it can reach the internet. Because that means it's now, um, so what I did, I established like additional bridge. So any packets that are received, it will go through my laptop that is connected, so you can still search the internet just fine. Okay, that looks okay. All right, let's turn on. Pineapp, Pineapp, where are you? If you see it before I do, it says Pineapp at the top. There we are. Okay, so we are going to turn on Karma and also the Pineapp daemon. So what we're doing here, <laughs> this is lovely, this is, this is good. They, they did a good job on this. So with the Pineapple, it says whatever SID it does detect, it actually starts to say, I am the one, I am the one, and will start to connect on your phones. Look at your phones. Um, in fact, disconnect from Hack5, and now you will start to see that your devices are starting to connect to previous things that you've had on your, on your um, home device. Is it showing you now? Let me turn it on. Everything on. Good. Okay, while well, that's starting, let me start Wireshark. Is anyone else seeing that? Like, is your, does your phone say that now you are connected to a device that it's not even hackable anymore? No one? Yay, nay? Okay, well, if you did try this, you would have actually seen that, in fact, if I turn this on, if I go into my phone, Wi-Fi, yeah, mine says it's connected to a different access point that I actually connected to back in California. But this actual device is doing it. And another thing that happens is if you want to search the internet or so, you should still be able to search the internet just fine because it's coming through my device, but I can intercept and view all the packets that you're sending now.
Nice. Lan. Start. Okay, we'll let that run. So this is working for a few people here. And see, I'm, I'm back on the internet, so I'm starting to get messages again. All right, so let's go back, and then I'll finish. I'll, I'll round up. I'll round up, Mr. Chris. Almost there. And then you'll want questions as well. Well, <laughs> you give a mouse a cookie, and I'll ask for a glass of milk as well. OK, so here are some recommendations that I have about this entire um, protocol. So one of the things is we definitely need an enhancement to the protocol, because yes, we write software and hacking tools, but it's also good to understand how can we make our entire paradigm better. So the first thing, we definitely need a way to better tuple the actual SIDS that your phone knows and the GPS location. It's simple. All of your smart devices have GPS already. So this should not be too far of a gap to add this onto your phones. Once it is there, your phone should then say, wait a minute, you're not in the area that I've known you before. Do you still want to connect? That should not be too hard to have. The next thing, on your phones. OK, so as I say, when we were young, OK, yay high, there are two things our parents always told us. First thing, look left and right before you cross the street. The second thing, always have unique SIDs in your access points, right? I mean, that, that's what they did. However, in this case, oh, activate Windows. Now, in this case, I say that having unique SIDs for a demo laptop, because hackers, you will definitely crash this machine, so I, I don't care what happens. All right. So your access points actually having unique, very unique SIDs is actually what makes it more capable for me to track you. Because if I've only seen that particular SID in one area, now I know that you've been in that area. So that's just one thing to know about. Another thing, how often have we actually audited the networks that you've connected to? If, we were, if I was to leave this on, I, like yesterday, I saw some people that have like 15, 20, about 17 different SIDs that your phone is actively beaconing to. You don't need those. As soon as you leave a network that you, like, if you're going to the airport, it's a free Wi-Fi, when you're done, remove it. So it makes it harder for a person like me to come back and track where you've been in the past. And then, since I built this framework, uh, next year I'm also ex planning to build a separate exfiltration that doesn't even need internet itself, but we need a better capability now of people to actually audit the 802.11 protocol because you're starting to see people to exfiltrate data just using the 802.11. Different frames out there, I can now have covert channels, command and control without using the internet. Don't trust me, no problem. You will see that tool released next year. Okay, uh, let me look, wait, I don't have control. Move on, okay, that's it, that's all. Let me stop. Upcoming, no. All right, I stopped there. So just um, questions, can I have a question? I guess I'm out of time. If there are que can I have a question? Have a question? Okay. Does anybody have a question? No, nobody has a question. Very good, okay. <laughs> No problem. Thank you very much for your time.